The chant speaks of the setting sun, of dusk, a time of quiet, most favored by the gods. As the Ali'i receive their manna directly from the gods, the exquisite peace found at evening was reserved for them. Although mana existed in all life, the highest born, the chiefs or li'i, as direct descendants of the gods, could, by implication, claim the greatest amount of mana, and enormous deference was accorded them. It was kapu, forbidden, to step within the shadow of an ali'i, or to allow one's own shadow to fall upon an ali'i. To do so might steal his mana, and violation of this kapu meant almost certain death. To protect their people from accidentally breaking this kapu, a conch was blown to announce the imminent arrival of an ali'i. Thus alerted, a commoner had time enough to move out of the way or prostrate himself so no shadow could fall. The rules of kapu both separated the classes and bound them together. Ritualized laws of behavior and obligation assigned a place for each person and protected that place. As keepers of knowledge, chanters of the sacred genealogies, and protectors of the rites at Heyo, the priestly class claimed the second greatest amount of mana. The kahuna was the, uh, was, you might say, the, the, the man who uh, taught the people. There were four, there were several, many different kinds of kahuna who were, uh, you might say, uh, specialized in different arts, different occupations, who taught, you might say, the people in their various um, uh, uh, occupations and various ways of life. For example, we, what we call the kahuna lapa'au, la'au, was a man who was uh, uh, medicine, in medicine. We have the, uh, uh, the kahuna lawai'a, was a man who taught fishing. Uh, we have the uh, 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 kahuna mahi'ai, which was a man who taught farming and so forth. The kahuna and the ali'i directed the work of the class beneath them, the commoners, the maka'ai na na. The maka'ai na na were the doers, the fishermen and the farmers. They had many couple to observe. They were strict in terms of what fish to catch. For example, during the makahiki, you did not catch the, the aku and the ahi, but you ate the opelo and the akuli in terms of it. Um, kapus like that no longer exist. In, in terms of eating various um, bananas or various uh, uh, agricultural products, because of the season in which they were dormant or the, because of the season in which they were, were ready for the harvest. This is another way of maintaining a certain, a certain degree of excellence in their, in their foodstuffs. And what I, what I feel about this is that they developed it, it to a, such a high degree that they didn't forage for their food. They, they developed a plantation effect. Two of the very popular food fish were the aku and the opelu. And we have a feeling that the old folks studied the breeding habits of the fish. And they decided that the opelu uh, laid their eggs and so forth uh, during the first half of the year, according to our calendar, January to June or July. So during that time, the fisher folk uh, caught aku, but didn't touch the opelu. Then came July, and they let the Aku go about their uh, matrimonial affairs, and they caught the opelu. Kapu prevented ancient Hawaiians from depleting their food sources. 
There were also kapu that required prayers and offerings to appropriate God forces to ensure a favorable outcome in their endeavors. He usually didn't say to Kuula, give me a good catch today. He would say, uh, I would like to appeal to you to have the fish multiply and be abundant. I would like to appeal to you to have fish come into our area. It was, there's, there's a difference in a seemingly greedy attempt to have lots of fish. No, he wanted nature to work sort of in his direction, you see. And that was kind of a nice way. And then when he came back in, he either brought the first fish of his catch and put it at Kula, or he might bring the first one of each kind that he caught. The whole thing was uh, with its religious overtones. And I believe in that because uh, if you are saying your little prayers to the gods, that causes you to be sincere. And you look over your bait and your lines and your hooks and you go out with the right attitude. And you, by the way, tell your wife while you're out fishing, don't gossip <laughs> at home. Uh -huh. Ecological awareness among Hawaiians is seen not only in conservation kapu, but within a sophisticated system of land division and agricultural technology. Land was distributed in Ahu Pua'a, often pie-shaped sections incorporating a complete valley from the mountain to the sea assuring its occupant access to fishing, agricultural plots of taro and other lowland crops, and products from higher forest elevations. The Ahupua'a were virtually self-sufficient. Controlled by ali'i, lesser chiefs or land managers, the Ahupua'a were worked by Maka'ai Nana, who supported their chiefs with its produce but who also held ready access to its bounty. They were sophisticated in their planting. They were sophisticated in their aquaculture. Um, in the sophistication of their planting, you had many varieties of bananas, my ah. You had many varieties of sweet potatoes. You had many varieties. You have over 300 varieties of, of taro or kalo. Masterfully terraced taro gardens were fed by elaborate irrigation systems which maximized the conservation of fresh water, an achievement found nowhere else in Polynesia. The water goes down through the terraces very gradually so that the, um, uh, the water doesn't heat up from the sun and rot the taro, and, but not so fast that the water would erode the terraces. You wouldn't want that to happen. So the irrigation system, the ditches that they built, the aoi that they built, would control the, the speed of the water. And the amount of the water would be controlled by the type of dam that you put up. And so you can control, it's a method of controlling water and getting what you need, where you need it, when you need it. So this is a big um, engineering project, and, I'm, and they did it. <laughs> they were very good at it. The skill and engineering demonstrated in the terraces and irrigation systems were also present in the design, development, and success of an early and unparalleled form of aquaculture. The Hawaiians were the only Pacific Islanders that made shoreline fish ponds. So those are really artifacts, and they were really the ice boxes for the people. For when the weather was inclement and they couldn't go fishing, they could go to the fish ponds and dip up the fish that they needed. We do think that the chiefs did a little more dipping into the fish ponds than the Maka'inana, but at least if the chiefs got their fish out of their ponds, that let the Maka'inana go out and have greater use of the fish in the open bay or open sea. What you really have is, it's like a, like a pasture. You have a pasture in which you create the environment, the best environment that you can for growing algae. And 
the more algae you have, the more food you have for the fish, and that's very attractive to the fish to come in and have all this food growing there. And, uh, and then they get fat, and then they can't go out the same way they came in because they're too fat now. And so um, the, it's really very ingenious of the Hawaiians to have selected the herbivore link to raise in their fish ponds. You look at some of the monumental things that were structured, like, uh, like some of the hay elves and some of the fish ponds. When you look at that kind of work, you wonder, at least I wonder, and say, boy, to do that back-breaking work, to haul the rocks all the distances they had to, really required some kind of discipline. If you didn't have discipline, you would have had revolution. And revolution was almost non-existent, so far as I know, in the Hawaiian society. Artists, scientists, poets, craftsmen, fishermen, farmers, hula dancers, each had his place and his duties in Hawaiian society. And generation upon generation, those skills were passed on through an oral transmission from the kahuna and the poet, trained in the skills of memory. In truth, the very survival of the Hawaiians depended on the accurate storage and retrieval of their accumulated knowledge, kept within the lines of precisely memorized oli, or chants. Chant was life, because the language was life. The way you communicated was through the language. Well, you had a lot of body language too, but still, there was so much in the word, the famous proverb, in the word is life, in the word is death. That carries the whole concept of mana, power. Certain words, certain chants had so much power. They were used for such a long time. They became so sacred, so couple, that um, they could, to the Hawaiian, in their belief, change a life or um, start a life or end a life. The chanted poetry of the Oli was delivered in long, sustained phrases, sometimes using only two pitches, sometimes more. There are six major styles of chanting, all of which required certain pitches, voice qualities, and methods of delivery. There were some very particular things that Hawaiian chanters did. One was to hold the voice entirely up in the throat. They didn't sing from down here as an opera singer would, or the way one is taught to sing in the Western way is, use your chest, use your diaphragm. The Hawaiian chanters uh, placed their voice in the throat. They had a lot of tension created. A very small area uh, was used to project one's voice. They chanted at a relatively high level. It's chanted in what's called a kind of a mid-register. It's not a chest and it's not a head. A head register would be something that's called falsetto, but this is right in between. There's a lot of crea uh, tension created in the sound that way. There were over 100 terms describing types of chants according to their purposes. The voice quality was determined by the function of the chant. Oli could free someone from kapu, express sorrow, declare love, praise a hero, or a great feat, in addition to maintaining the history of an individual or family. And each function required a certain unique way of chanting. And all of these are related to the general styles and they're related to the functions. So you will not do an uh, a ho'u uwe uwe, which is a style of wailing, using various particular voice qualities in that for a love chant or for a praise chant or a name chant because functionally a praise chant does not require wailing you have to go to a uh, lamentation a kaniko <laughs>
How reliable are the chants as sources of history? In order to answer that, one has to answer the question of why they did not have writing. And they did not have writing, I believe, because the word was so important. The words itself had power. And, and one, if one put words into writing and distributed it, then anyone could have that power, including those who were not worthy of it. So, so uh, knowledge was kept um, to those who were deemed worthy, worthy of it. The Hawaiians had, would penalize their orators with death in some instances if they did not, or if they missed a line in public oratory. So I would say that you could more or less trust that what, they, what we have is uh, a lot of attention has been given to try to keep, keep these traditions intact. There was a reverence for the word. Uh, we know that some of their chants would last an entire day and had to be word perfect in order for the chant to work, uh, to invoke uh, a, the help of a particular uh, spirit. So there was a reverence for the word, which suggests to me that, that the words did not change very much over, over the centuries, that, that they were kept uh, carefully. The feudal society built by ancient Hawaiians appears, on the surface, strict, inhibiting, brutal at times. Yet the precision of its oral tradition, even its kapu, found the Hawaiians at the zenith of their culture, virtually disease-free and prosperous. It's very easy for us who grew up in a different kind of society to, to make a comparison of that society to us and, and end up saying, boy, that was an unjust society. If you had to live at that time, you would probably have found it a very just society. And that's the way I'd like to look at it. At once just and harsh, sophisticated, complex, self-sufficient and self-contained. The society created by ancient Hawaiians by the middle of the 18th century achieved a cultural, economic and technological peak unrivaled in Polynesia. It worked. Yet, at its very height, a new voice was heard that rose above the chanted memories of the people. In the words of the prophet, Keaulumoku came a new chant, clouded at first in its imagery. But as time passed, its message grew painfully clear. This chant foresaw the coming of the white man, the death of the royal line, suppression of the ancient religion, gods and goddesses, the disappearance of most things Hawaiian. A challenge, too, was left to the Hawaiian people. Au a ia e tama, e tonamoku, o tonamoku e tama, e au a ia. Hold fast, child, to your land, to your land, child, hold fast. Na na yala pepe,
Major funding for Hawaiians was provided by Hawaii Public Television, with additional funding made possible by Bank of Hawaii. Transportation for the production of Hawaiians was provided by Aloha Airlines. Major funding for Hawaiians was provided by Hawaii Public Television, with additional funding made possible by Bank of Hawaii. We continue to see birds every day, and we saw several turtles. All of these are looked upon as signs of the vicinity of land. We, however, saw none until daybreak in the morning of the 18th, when an island was discovered bearing northeast by east, and soon after we saw more land bearing north, entirely detached from the first. On the beach at Waimea, Kauai, a man named Moapu was fishing. Hawaiian historian Samuel Kamakau later translated his eyewitness account. We were out fishing and saw a strange thing move by and lights on board. We hurried ashore to tell Kaeo and the other chiefs of Kauai Chiefs and commoners saw the wonderful sight. Some were terrified and shrieked with fear. One asked the other, what are those branching things? And the other answered, there are trees moving about on the sea. As the resolution and discovery approached Kauai, the isolation that created a uniquely Hawaiian culture came to an end. This was the moment of cultural collision, the moment of contact. We were in some doubt whether or no the land before us was inhabited. This doubt was soon cleared up by seeing some canoes coming off the shore towards the ship. We saw men on the ship with white foreheads, sparkling eyes, and long heads, who spoke a strange language and breathed fire from their mouths, and who had much iron lying about on their floating heiau. As there were some venereal complaints on both ships, I gave orders that no women on any account whatever were to be admitted on board the ships. And I ordered that none who had the venereal upon them should go out of the ships. Yet I am much afraid that Before long, island women took to sleeping with foreigners to obtain cloth, iron, and mirrors, and a fateful damage was done. During Cook's second visit in 1779 at Kealakekua Bay, the lack of understanding between the cultures resulted in tragedy. In trying to recover a stolen boat, the English became involved in a fight with Chief Kalani Opu'u and his men. Cook was killed. The foreigners soon left, but their influence was just beginning to test the strength of Hawaii's spiritual and cultural uniqueness. 
Could Hawaiians withstand the seeds sown in Cook's initial year of contact? Gonorrhea, syphilis, prostitution, alcohol, tobacco, fleas, centipedes, scorpions, mosquitoes, epidemics, and firearms. First to recognize the advantages foreigners could bring to warfare was the nearly seven foot tall favorite nephew of Kalanio Pu'u, Kamehameha of Kohala. While others prostrated themselves before the foreigners, Kamehameha's quick mind recognized a superior technology which could give him an edge over the other chiefs. In 1791, Using the cannon and rifle, he launched a campaign to unify the islands. The success of Kamehameha may be in large part attributed to the fact that he controlled major ports and major sources of provisions. Kealakakua Bay, Kailua Bay, Kauaihai Bay. And so he had access to visiting uh, ships. He got himself into the provisioning business in a big way and he was able to get firearms, uh, whereas chiefs of other parts of this island were not so fortunate. They didn't have the harbors. Kamehameha's decisive campaign for the islands ended dramatically on Oahu at the Nu'uanupali, where remnants of the defenders either scattered in the hills or fell a thousand feet to their deaths. Fourteen years would elapse before Kauai would enter the fold. But the conquering of Oahu in 1810 marks the unification of the Hawaiian Kingdom. In peace as in war, Kamehameha guided his young nation as he ruled himself, with strict adherence to traditional society. He governed justly, according to custom, ruling his kingdom from his taro patches at Kohala. He died at Kailua, the last of the traditional kings, the last great ali'i. In the early 18th century, many Hawaiians were going out on sailing ships, working on sailing ships all over the world and coming back to Kamehameha with stories that out there were continents swarming with millions of people. And the ruling chiefs, uh, became very much aware that they were really a very small part of this world. And it bothered them. They knew that they would have to establish parity with Europe uh, and win some recognition from Europe. Uh, or if they didn't, uh, they would be devoured by the first European power that decided to uh, make a conquest of these islands. Ultimately, commerce served to undo traditional kingship and traditional society. In the early 1800s, Pacific fur traders learned of the existence of sandalwood here. Knowing the high prices the fragrant wood could bring, they descended on the islands. Well, of course, they represented commercial exploitation or capitalism, that is, seeking material goods in order to gain profit so that one could oneself gain more material possessions, which of course was very foreign to Hawaiians. And their whole existence was not based on the profit individual motive, but rather group affiliation and sharing. So we have cultural clash. A veritable rape of the forest ensued. The people labored endlessly with no reward neglecting their crops at the direction of the chiefs. They were reduced to eating herbs and fern trunks because there was no food to be had. There was famine, there was disease, and many died. Meanwhile, the chiefs lavished themselves with everything from European clothing to billiard tables, payable in sandalwood. By 1826, Hawaiian chiefs were in debt to the foreign traders. Too many Hawaiians anyway quickly acquired this desire for material possessions and especially the chiefs. And that's 
was a major factor in the erosion of the political and social and economic structure of the old society. Within a few years, sandalwood was gone, and Hawaii's economic dependence quickly shifted to whaling. That industry brought prosperity and revitalized harbor activity in Lahaina, Hilo, and Honolulu. But it brought more foreigners, and it took many Hawaiian men away on ships, further depleting the population. It also continued to change the Hawaiian world. The mana of the white man of uh, Western civilization that was seen in the form of the ships, uh, cannons, uh, iron tools, uh, and so forth, um, challenged the mana of the Hawaiian. And the Hawaiians were smart enough to see that there was a great deal more power in uh, some of the technology, some of the new ways that uh, Cook and um, other visitors uh, brought with them. When the, the Hawaiians met these people from overseas, they would sit down and talk to them. They would ask them questions about the world they didn't know, and the foreigners would give them answers. And inevitably, these uh, answers were uh, had an influence on the on the uh, eventual behavior of the Hawaiians. I don't say that they uh, were the predominant influence. They simply they were taking in a great deal of information. 1819 was a pivotal year. The great chief Kamehameha died, to be succeeded by his son Liholiho. This marked the end of the old ways. First to fall to make way for the new ways was the ancient Hawaiian social structure, the kapu system. Liholiho, at the direction of the dowager queen, Ka'ahumanu, caused a feast to be prepared at Kailua, where the young king seated himself in the vacant place at the women's table and began to eat. The kapu was broken. He ordered Heiau destroyed and carved god images burned. This destroyed the entire framework of traditional government with nothing to replace it right away. So in 1819, uh, a very close-knit society with close-knit rules, a society that was functioning, had functioned for a long time, defined the way people thought about themselves, was simply destroyed all at once. In a remarkable coincidence of history, as Hawaiian society began to unravel from within, an evangelical revival spread over Europe and America, spurring waves of missionaries whose sole purpose was to save the heathen from himself. The Reverend Hiram Bingham. Little did any of the actors in the drama imagine that the measures they attempted were preparing for the introduction of a spiritual and holy religion. How conspicuous the wisdom and goodness of God to have provided a Christian mission for these islands at this auspicious moment. The European world of, say, the 1820s, 30s, and 40s saw their own way as the only way. And so native peoples who were not like Europeans uh, should be changed and should be improved. Armed only in the zealous belief that their work was wholly for the good of others and the glory of God, a pioneer company of missionaries, teachers, craftsmen, three American-educated Hawaiians, and one doctor set sail for Hawaii. March 31, 1820, at Kailua Kuna, the missionaries encountered the first of their intended converts. The appearance of destitution, degradation, and barbarism among the chattering, almost naked savages was appalling. Some in our number, with gushing tears, turned away from the spectacle. Can these be human beings? Can such beings be civilized? Can they be Christianized? Can we throw ourselves upon these rude shores and take up our abode for life among such a people for the purpose of training them for heaven? To Hawaiians, the missionaries provided a humorous spectacle. White women, dressed with puritanical modesty, 
were quickly tagged long necks because of their high collars. But the missionaries were given a one-year trial by Liholiho, allowing them time to observe Hawaiians. The missionaries <clears throat> were horrified when they were here long enough to really get in command of the situation. Here were grown men out in the surf at 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Now back in New England, we worked during the day and in the evening perhaps we uh, played games. So one of the missionaries said to a chief, why are you wasting your time and energy uh, on games this time of day? And the chief looked at him and said, we build our houses, we cultivate our fields out of necessity. We play our games because our hearts are in them. <laughs> Just as wasteful of time to the missionary mind was music and dance. In the hula, the dancers are often fantastically decorated with figured or colored kapa, green leaves, fresh flowers, and sometimes on the ankle, hundreds of dog's teeth. Much of the person is uncovered. Melody and harmony are scarcely known to them. The whole arrangement of their hulas were designed to promote lasciviousness. Work of the mission proceeded slowly. Preaching, or pule, attracted some attention. But without a written Hawaiian language, teaching was difficult. In 1822, the missionary William Ellis arrived from Tahiti, fluent in that language. He greatly assisted the American mission in reducing the similar Hawaiian language into sounds they themselves could understand. In the process, irrevocable decisions were made. Well, it changed uh, the pronunciation of the language. For example, by show of hands, they decided that we were going to have an L and not an R, that we were going to have K, but not a T. In January 1822, at the mission houses in Honolulu, lead type was set to form the page of a rudimentary speller. The pull of the hand lever then created the Hawaiian language's earliest imprint. Within a few years, the Bible too was translated, and it was used to teach Hawaiians their own language in written form. By the 1840s, Hawaii ranked among the most literate nations in the world. Letters, writings, and publications from the period are the only written clues to the ancient Hawaiian language. Well, the missionaries, of course, gave us their religion, and they gave us also a new language because they recorded our language made certain changes in it, some important, profound changes in our language, and in a sense, therefore, gave us a new culture. We, be, we became westernized and progressively de-Hawaiianized. One product of missionary education was a young Hawaiian man born in the 1790s and educated at Lahaina Luna School. Hawaiian historian David Malo saw what was coming and feared for his people during this time of transition. In a private letter to Kina'u, premier under Kamehameha III, he writes in 1837, If a big wave comes in, large fishes will come from the dark ocean which you never saw before. And when they see the small fishes, they will eat them up. The ships of the white men have come, and smart people have arrived from the great countries. They know our people are few in number and living in a small country. They will eat us up. In order to deal with the Western governments who are coming in and pressuring you folks to um, pay up your bills and um, do this and do that, uh, in order to deal with those Western governments, you had to create a government of your own that was Western in shape and form and content so that you could deal with them. There was a 
tremendous rush um, on the part of the ruling chiefs, the chief of the families, to become as westernized as quickly as possible. And historians haven't really understood the motive for this. They have poked fun, perhaps, at the idea of a, a Hawaiian chief wearing a malo and a top hat. Um, what they really haven't uh, uncovered was the basic reason for this rush to become uh, westernized. And it was, uh, I believe, uh, an urgent need to establish parity with Europe for, uh, for Hawaii's own survival. Hawaii's first constitution in 1840 incorporated these Western concepts, establishing Kamehameha III as the first westernized Hawaiian monarch. The constitution created a Bill of Rights, a legislative body chosen by the people, and a Supreme Court. The running of a Western-style government required experience the king found only in foreign advisors with which he surrounded himself. Men such as the Minister of the Interior, former American missionary Jarrett P. Judd, Scotsman Robert C. Wiley, who was appointed Minister of Foreign Relations, and American John Record, who served as Attorney General. In reaching for what seemed good for his people, Kamehameha III could not foresee the long-term consequences of his actions. It was not long before Hawaiian people began expressing concern at the pervasive influence of these foreigners in their government. Hawaiian historian Samuel Kamakau, in 1845, records the apprehensions of some older Hawaiians. The king has chosen foreign ministers, foreign agents. This is wrong. Hawaiian people will be trodden underfoot by the foreigners. Entertaining foreigners is the beginning which will lead to the government coming into the hands of the foreigner and the Hawaiian people becoming their servants to work for them. Let chiefs fill the vacancies, and do not let all of the government positions go to the hands of the foreigner. See, the excuse given by the monarchs in the early and even the later years was, oh, we don't have people who are trained to become, for example, uh, minister of the interior, or to become uh, minister of education, or to become minister of health. But no serious attempt was made to train and educate people to take these positions. Of greater concern to Hawaiians was the increasing foreign demand for land ownership, a concept basic to the Western mind. Interestingly, the Hawaiian language did not include a word for the phrase private property ownership. Uh, the people knew that that, that they lived under a ruling chief, and the ruling chief had the responsibility of making land available to everybody under his, under his domain, see? Uh, land was not a commodity of exchange or sale. It was, a, it, it was, it was something that some, so every, everyone needed to subsist and to survive, you see? No one owned the land privately. It was not their private domain. And it's very interesting that, um, uh, you know, the reason for this is that, that the land was set here by the gods, so no one would presume to own anything that the gods had set forth, uh, created. The Constitution of 1840 did little to address the growing land issue, other than to clarify that the land was in the care of the king. But in the 1830s, he began granting permission to sugar planters to start experimental crops. First, to Ladd and Company on Kauai. This marked the beginning of a new and potentially rich industry. But the planters, unable to buy or lease the land, could not justify the heavy capital investments they were anxious to make. So, the clamor was on to reform the land system to provide for fee-simple ownership.
In a flurry of correspondence with the king during the year 1845, Hawaiian subjects from throughout the kingdom expressed concern over the increasing foreign desire for land. Historian David Malo translates one petition from Lahaina. Foreigners come on shore with cash ready to purchase land. But we have not the means to purchase lands. The native is disabled like one who has long been afflicted with a disease on his back. If you, the chiefs, decide immediately to sell land to foreigners, we shall immediately be overcome. We, to whom the land has belonged from the beginning, shall all dwindle away. Fueling the movement were the missionaries, who believed that the Hawaiian people could not be truly independent and self-supporting unless they were released from the bondage of laboring for the chiefs and could acquire a vested interest in the property on which they lived and worked. Give the land to the people. Let each man have his little farm. Uh, owning it, he would improve it and become a good uh, yeoman farmer of the new Hawaiian nation. That was the king's intent. That was the intent of the policy makers. Uh, do good for the people. Uh, relieve them of the burdens of feudal service. You know, relieve them of their responsibilities to the chiefs. That was good, but you also relieve them from the protection of the chiefs. And you, you severed the mutually beneficial bonds between elements of society at that point. The Mahele of 1848, or the Great Mahele, as it is often called, was the king's answer to the pressing problem of land reform. The word Mahele means portion or division. On January 27, 1848, the lands were divided with 2.5 million acres going to the king and 1.5 million to the chiefs. The king declared 1.5 million acres of his land as government lands administered by the legislature. And 1 million acres he reserved for himself, calling them crown lands. Awards to the 250 chiefs were registered in this Mahele book and signed by the king. It was these lands the commoners were allowed to make claims against through the Kuleana Act of 1850. To get that land, a commoner had to come forward and prove his family had been living on and cultivating that plot. It sounded simple, an ideal solution in theory, but it was a radical departure from the Hawaiian reality. The whole concept, the whole notion of owning land was foreign, so many Hawaiians did not even understand why you had to go and get a piece of paper to say that you own that land, because for generations their family had cultivated the land. And everyone knew that they were the people who lived on that land. That land was theirs. Their ancestors were buried in the land. Their bones are in the land. So what more, why, why do you need a piece of paper when you have your bones in the land to prove your ownership? From Napo'opo'o on the Big Island, in 1852, a Hawaiian subject writes to the land commissioners. We are those who have kulianas in the land bought by the foreigner P. Cummings, the one who purchased Vaipuna'ula. The foreigner is saying that the natives have no rights to his land, none whatsoever. But these people are the ones who have rights granted them by Kamakau, and Pili, and have witnesses. We look anxiously to receiving help so that we may live on our lands comfortably. Love to you, God grant you life. Many Hawaiians, however, many commoners, did not even apply for the land because um, they had to make their claim against their chief. And they were intimidated in many cases from doing that. It took a lot of courage to tell the chief who you had lived under and who you believe to be a god, a living god, to say that you have the right to claim some land away from that chief. What followed was a nightmare for the Hawaiian people, 
the land had to be surveyed before an award was granted. That required money, which Hawaiians did not have. Property was taxed, not in goods and services, but in dollars. To get money for taxes and surveys, many people left their land to get jobs in town or aboard ships. While they were away, their land was often adversely possessed or simply absorbed by a neighboring owner. Now, after the great Mahele, land then became a, a marketable commodity. It was never a marketable commodity before that. And as a result of that, many Hawaiians who couldn't, who couldn't survive in, in, in the commodity market eventually didn't have any lands to, to live on, you see. I think this is one of the, in my mind, it is one of the greatest evils foisted upon that society at that time. The chiefs were also selling off their land to foreigners, and the commoners working those lands were turned out, becoming wanderers or contract laborers, passive victims of the new system. Others were dispossessed through favoritism and interference by chiefs and land agents. A letter to the Minister of the Interior describes the plight of residents of Kaupo, East Maui. We humbly complain to you. Dismiss John T. Gower, our land agent. It is not right that when we offer to buy our own lands, that he should sell them to foreigners. We offered up to three dollars. The foreigner offered three dollars and got it. It was a swindle and a lie. The law states that the residents have first choice. And if it is not taken up, then sell to the outsider. He is angry, and we are afraid. And so the great division became the great dispossession. For in the final analysis of over four million acres distributed in the Mahele, Less than 29,000 acres actually went to the common people, land equal in size to the smallest Hawaiian island, Kaho'olawe. Seventy percent of the Hawaiian population was left with no land at all. They were there, they'd been used to having water rights, used to growing up in the mountains, getting timber and thatch and all that. But when they were given just to Kuleana, they were more or less fenced in by that. So that system did not work. It was prompted by the merchants and the would-be plantation owners and all who wanted lots of land. So the Hawaiians found themselves almost landless. One of the th reasons why the Westerners said that the Hawaiians should own their own lands and become farmers, independent farmers, was, they said, because they were beholden to the chief all the time. They always had to do what the chief said to do, and they had to pay him taxes. And of course, their idea was that if you get and give the farmer his own land, then he's no longer beholden to the chief. But that isn't what really happened, because he got his pasture land taken away from him. And uh, also, um, uh, Many of the people didn't get land, and it made them more beholden to the chiefs than ever before. They had uh, to, in, in essence, sell themselves as kind of a slavery, really, sell themselves to the chiefs in order to have a place to live. Most times it meant they had to move away from their families and live in the city, in the port town away from their rural areas, but most importantly, away from their ohana, their family system. And so the mahele meant uh, the breaking up of that cohesive family unit, that, well, which was the extended family system. The foreigners profited by the arrangement and were well taken care of by the government. It was the race who owned the government who were not defended. Of our Hawaiian people, 651 sailed for the east on foreign ships. Many are unaccounted for. At Papeete in Tahiti, there were over 400 Hawaiians. In Oregon, 500. At Paita in Peru, 50. And many have gone on to 
Nantucket, New Bedford, Sag Harbor, New London, and other American ports, and lived like wanderers in foreign lands. What a pity. Not only was a physical change, but it was such a change to their lifestyle, to their spirit. And we have a feeling that uh, when their spirit was broken by uh, being thrust into a totally different culture, that they were more susceptible to diseases. Illnesses like measles, curable in the Western world, had by now ravaged the Hawaiian population, which had no immunity. When the um, uh, diseases came in, not only were the kahuna lapa'au at a loss, but so were the doctors. The uh, mainland uh, missionary doctors who came in at that time were not able to cure or prevent. Uh, eventually smallpox, yes, measles, mumps and all that. And some of our fine chiefs and uh, thousands of people died from those diseases. Specialists have studied the depopulation of the islands and point out that uh, these epidemics cannot entirely account for the decline in the population. And we know from individual anecdotal experiences that many Hawaiians chose no longer to, to live in an environment which they found to be so hostile, in which there was no longer uh, hope for a meaningful life. In less than 100 years, the Hawaiian population, estimated at 300,000 when Cook arrived, plunged to less than 60,000 by 1870. In the years 1850 to 1853 alone, 11,000 Hawaiians died. This rapid decline in the Hawaiian population came at a time when the need for labor became acute. Because of the mahele, sugar companies could now buy large tracts of land, and more workers were needed. Hawaiians did almost all the plantation labor in the early years, but the declining native population couldn't keep up with the industry's growth. Shiploads of immigrant laborers from China, Japan, and later the Philippines were brought in, forever changing the ethnic makeup of the islands. These people contributed to an incredible growth in sugar. The 500,000 pounds produced from 1855 to 1857 multiplied into 19 million pounds from 1870 to 1872, a 37 times increase. When you, have, when you uh, produce sugar, you have to sell it. People aren't coming to you to buy it. You have to sell it. You have to arrange some sort of trade treaty to, in order to sell it. So this was a period of economic transition uh, for Kamehameha IV, and it uh, went on to the, to the uh, time of Kamehameha V, who reigned from 1863 to 1872. Sugar planters were clamoring for a reciprocity treaty with the United States an agreement that would allow Hawaiian sugar to be sold in America without the heavy duties attached to foreign products. One Honolulu businessman said the whole plantation system would be ruined without a reciprocity treaty. Alexander Liholiho, Kamehameha IV, worked to secure an agreement, but all efforts failed. In 1863, shattered by the death of his infant son, he died without naming an heir. So his elder brother, Lot, became Kamehameha V. And more years of negotiation failed at reciprocity. A bachelor, Kamehameha V died in 1872. And the Kamehameha dynasty was gone. A cousin, William Lunalilo, became Hawaii's first elected monarch. Immensely popular, the people's king was unable to formulate an acceptable treaty before his untimely death. Hawaii's kings worked in vain for reciprocity. Then, David Kalakaua ascended the throne. He went to uh, 
Washington. He met the members of Congress. He was entertained at the White House. He was a great, he made a great hit. He and President Grant uh, hit it off beautifully together. And he did what hadn't been able, they, nobody had been able to do for 25 years. He had got the Senate to pass the Reciprocity Treaty, which produced a boom in sugar here in the islands. Kalakaua's successful negotiation of the treaty and the designation of his sister as heir apparent secured both the well-being of his kingdom's economy and the succession of his line. The next thing he wanted to do was to popularize the monarchy and not for his own aggrandizement, but to build up the pride of his people, of the Hawaiian people in their uh, mo in the monarchy, in their chiefs, in their way of life. And to do this, he did a number of things. He um, brought in new technology. He also uh, went back to the old myths. He wrote a book on the myths and legends of Hawaii. He, uh, was, a, uh, he was a collector of Hawaiian artifacts, many of which we hope to have here at the palace uh, later on on display. He uh, took a world tour to find out what firsthand, what, what other uh, monarchs were doing. Also to look into uh, the possibility of labor from the various sources around the world. He uh, espoused education, public health, and he built Iolani Palace. Iolani Palace is the most vivid example of Kalakaua's Victorian optimism. But in so many more ways, he was truly a Renaissance man. As the first reigning monarch to circumnavigate the globe, Kalakaua quickly grasped new technologies and the advantages of alliances with other royal households. He even sought betrothal of his niece, Kaiulani, to the Crown Prince of Japan. During his reign, the electric light was introduced. A streetcar system launched public transportation, and the nation's second telephone system connected Iolani Palace with the king's boathouse. Kalakaua built an opera house, completed Ali'iolani Hale, the country's first government building. He built schools, hospitals, and without regard to the attitudes of the missionaries, revoked the ban on hula and reinstated the dance to its rightful position as premier among Hawaiian entertainments. And, for himself and his family, he provided the most elaborate Victorian fashion money could buy. He had been well educated, but more than that, he was ambitious. He was a self-improver. He developed himself. Uh, and throughout his early life, you, you see him as a, a reacher. And um, if it was necessary to learn to be a great public speaker, he would do that. If it was necessary to uh, speak English beautifully, he would do that. If it was necessary to um, uh, develop courtliness, to learn the rules of etiquette flawlessly, uh, although all the chiefs were trained in this area, Klakawa would be brilliant. A brilliant man. And it is he who puts the finishing touches on the romantic Hawaiian monarchy. But the reign of Kalakaua was beset with criticism from all factions. Many Hawaiians saw their king and their government increasingly controlled by strangers. Irritated foreign-born merchants and planters, meanwhile, saw their taxes supporting the king's royal balls, stately dinners, and lavish exchange of gifts between heads of state. Early in 1887, dissident whites, feeling their influence on government policy was restricted, formed a secret organization known as the Hawaiian League. Its purpose was to limit the king's powers. Prominent members included attorney Lauren A. Thurston and judge Sanford B. Dole. Backed by the Honolulu Rifles, the League threatened Kalakaua with violence. On July 1st, the King accepted a reformed cabinet. 
which, five days later, presented for his signature the Constitution of 1887. This document limited voting rights to those who owned property and had a certain income, effectively disenfranchising native Hawaiians, excluding Asians, and shifting the balance of power to the whites. The king, no longer in command of his military or his veto power, was reduced to a ceremonial figure. The bayonet constitution, as it became known, was implemented while Kalakaua's queen, Kapiolani, and his sister, Princess Liliu Okalani, were en route home from London. In her autobiography, the heir apparent, Liliu Okalani, recalled, We arrived in Honolulu on the 26th day of July, 1887. A conspiracy against the peace of the Hawaiian kingdom had been taking place since spring. It assumed no less definite shape than the overthrow of the monarchy. King Kalakaua, my brother, appeared bright and glad to welcome us back. Yet we could see in his countenance traces of the terrible strain through which he had passed. Although it was only the commencement of the troubles preparing for our family and nation. The power of the monarchy continued to erode. The reform cabinet renewed the reciprocity treaty and also granted, over Klaakoa's objections, exclusive right to lease Pearl Harbor to the United States. Meanwhile, in the U.S. Congress, a bill was being proposed to protect American domestic sugar. The McKinley Tariff threatened to devastate Hawaii's one-crop economy. Against this backdrop, Kalakaua's health began to fail. He sailed for San Francisco to rest, but in California, Kalakaua weakened and died. Honolulu Harbor was festively decorated for his return, but on January 29, 1891, the USS Charleston rounded Diamond Head with its American and Hawaiian flags lowered to half-mast, its spars draped in black, and the king's body aboard. As news of the king's death spread throughout Honolulu, the reformed cabinet rushed to Iolani Palace to require Liliu Okalani to swear her allegiance to the Constitution of 1887. I was so overcome by the death of my brother that I hardly realized what was going on around me. I turned to my husband and inquired, what is the object of this meeting? He said, they had come to witness my taking the oath of office. Then I realized I was compelled to take the oath to the Constitution which had led to the death of my brother. Although second in line of succession after her younger brother, Lele Yohoku, who died in 1877, Liliu Kalani, at the age of 52, and while still in mourning, was proclaimed queen of the Hawaiian Islands. Among her first acts, she demanded and received resignations from the reform cabinet, entitled her husband, John Owen Dominus, as His Royal Highness the Prince Consort. And as she and her brothers were childless, like the Kamehamehas before them, secured the Kalakaua line by naming her 15-year-old niece, Kaiulani, as heir apparent. Sadly, the strikingly beautiful daughter of the Queen's sister, Princess Like Like and Scotsman Archibald Cleghorn, on whom the royal line depended, would die unmarried in 1899. Meanwhile, in April of 1891, the much-feared McKinley Tariff went into effect, 
subsidizing American domestic sugar by two cents a pound, eliminating duty on foreign imports, and giving foreign sugar producing countries the same advantage Hawaii had enjoyed exclusively. Lost revenues in the island sugar industry approached four million dollars the first year. Two cents a pound became the rallying cry for those who favored annexation of Hawaii to the United States as the only solution to the sugar crisis. The economy of the islands was tightly tied to the Hawaiian, I mean, to the United States economy. So that uh, politically, economically, in every way, Hawaii had been drawn closer and closer into the U.S. orbit. The Queen sought to regain the monarchical control lost in the Bayonet Constitution. To do that, she needed a strong cabinet, but the legislature repeatedly voted down her choices. Then, in this turmoil, her husband, John Dominus, died, leaving her to face Hawaii's future alone. She also found that she had lack of support from her, the Hawaiian leaders, uh, leaders of the Hawaiian community who should have backed her up, uh, whom she would assume would back her up, but who didn't. By, the time, by that time, the, the pressures from the foreign uh, uh, business people were overpowering. Uh, they built up to uh, such an extent that there was just no controlling them. And the um, American businessmen uh, felt that they, the only thing, that their only solution, uh, the only salvation for their economic lifestyle was to uh, change the government, the form of government. In response to petitions from her people, Liliu Okalani worked feverishly to prepare a constitution which would restore monarchical power. But she was betrayed by her own attorney general, Arthur Peterson, who made the document known to another secret society, the Annexation Club. A committee of safety was formed from Annexation Club members with the principal goal of directing the overthrow of the monarchy. On January 14, 1893, in the Blue Room at Iolani Palace, Liliu Okalani presented her constitution to her cabinet. They refused to sign. The Queen tried her best. She uh, tried to uh, get a new constitution promulgated. She felt that the constitution that had been forced on her brother which is known as the Bayonet Constitution, was, uh, it took too much power from the monarchy. The Committee of Safety called upon American Minister John Stevens to land Marines from the USS Boston, a warship anchored at Pearl Harbor. As the American forces formed a line across Iolani Palace grounds, the infamous committee members entered the palace to ask for Lilio Kalani's abdication. You have Lili Oklani finding herself in a position where um, to do right, to do what should have been done, is almost suicidal to herself and to her government. And you have Lili Oklani in a position where uh, compromise is necessary for survival, but where compromise is not possible and so the monarchy ends. The final act was the invasion of the Kingdom of Hawaii by United States naval forces, and which was called properly an act of war by President Grover Cleveland because it violated treaties between the Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States. The Committee of Safety Members of the Annexation Club became the provisional government and chose Sanford B. Dole as president. Its goal was to secure annexation to the United States. But if that failed, to create a Republic of Hawaii. January 17, 1893, the day the provisional government was declared, Liliu Okalani retired to her residence at Washington Place 
where she drafted this letter of protest to the provisional government and the President of the United States. I, Lili Uokalani, Queen by the grace of God and under the Constitution of the Hawaiian Kingdom, do hereby solemnly protest against any and all acts done against myself and the constitutional government of the Hawaiian Kingdom by certain persons claiming to have established a provisional government of and for this kingdom. Now, to avoid any collision of armed forces and perhaps the loss of life, I do, under this protest and impelled by said forces, yield my authority until such time as the government of the United States shall, upon the facts being presented to it, undo the action of its representative and reinstate me in the authority which I claim as the constitutional sovereign of these Hawaiian islands. In 1895, the political firebrand opportunist Robert Wilcox launched an undermanned, undersupplied, and unsuccessful counter-revolution. For Wilcox's act, the deposed queen was arrested and charged with treason. Tried in this, her own throne room at Iolani Palace, she was found guilty and sentenced to five years hard labor, subsequently reduced to imprisonment in a solitary room in the palace that had once been her home. Liliu Okalani, a singular woman on whom the tragedy of the Hawaiian race fell, lived 77 years. At her death in 1917, 139 years after the arrival of Cook, fewer than 40,000 Hawaiians survived, a population decrease of almost 90%. The people were gone, the heroes were gone, the religion was gone, the land was gone. The spoken history of 2,000 years was gone. And with her passing, the last Hawaiian hope was gone too.